That might be the fastest one in the world right now. Sitting here with Kyle Nielsen, welcome to Hard Parking with Jay Finning. Uh, excited that you took the time to come over here uh, because you got a lot of stuff to do. We're going to talk about all that stuff today, but welcome to the studio, man. Yeah, thanks for having me on, dude. I want to step through, we're going to talk about the car. Yeah. Because outside, we have we have the same car. Yours is just a lot faster now than mine. But we're going to save that. We're going to save that. Okay. You're a big sales guy. Yeah. You know, a lot of the podcasts, a lot of the appearances, a lot of the stage stuff, it's all revolves around sales and things like that. And so we're going to focus on less sales, more people, which is probably going to be a relief to you, you yep. know, to be able to talk about other other stuff. Um, I know that's your bread and butter, but tell us what is Aptive Sales? Yeah, Aptive Environmental, we're the fifth largest uh, residential pest control company in the nation. I've uh, been with them since we started back in 2016 then been with kind of that ownership group since 2007 and we've had a few other brands and companies we've built and sold and built and sold over the years but yeah I'm, i work in the environmental services pest control space and uh but we i run the the sales program of the company and you've been there for 17 years yes yeah, seven, the math yeah. correct yep 17 17 years yeah because you know you've talked about door to door and all that kind of stuff and i had jotted down on my notes i'm like door to door like cold calling businesses like no the there's people because I did hear pest control and I didn't know if, if it's, you know, active at the door or active acquires this company and, and does all their sales and things for them and then acquires this company or not really acquires mm -hmm. necessarily is, is, is work with, you know, I know you, you had made mention of um, like the solar panel solution. Cause that's kind of what I was thinking of too, mm -hmm. how door to door has kind of changed over the years yeah <laughs> a lot. And so anyway, 11, 11 summers of, of door knock. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, in, in a nutshell, yeah, I, we, we go out, we, we build sales teams, we train them in kind of the non buggy months. I mean, down here in Arizona, it's buggy year round. I know how much you love, you loved uh, being down here when and you're here. The summer is not the ideal time to be in Arizona. The ideal time in Arizona is October to April, October to May. But when you're knocking doors in May, June, July, August, and you get those streaks of 10 days in a row above 110, and you're out there walking from house to house to house and that little you know the awning or the the front porch with the 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 arch and stuff it's almost like stepping into a pizza oven you know you step into that and you're just kind of baking but i would i will tell you this i will i would take dry heat in arizona over humidity like florida or houston any day the humid heat is not not very very fun but we yeah we train our sales guys myself included back when i started and we would go knock doors like we don't have a lot of information. I mean, nowadays with, with technology, we have information about houses and homes and, and who our customers are and who's close by and, and we can kind of name drop. But back when I started, it was literally a Thomas guide or a Rand McNally map. I'd photocopy pages and say, let's go here, let's go there. And I'd highlight little circles. We would drop off our, our car partners and our, our sales crews at 10 or 11 in the morning. We'd go knock for, you know, till three or four. And then we'd get back, take a quick lunch from four to five, and then go knock doors again from five to nine or 10 at night. And you'd literally walk up to, you know, you start at one end of the street, knock on a door and give them a sales pitch and say, Hey, we're, we're doing pest control. Here are our current customers in your neighborhood. Here's the pricing. Do you have somebody? If you do, are you more price based decision making? Are you service based? What's working? What's not? What are your frustration points? And if they don't have a pest control company, then they're more than likely a do it yourself -er, or they're new into the neighborhood and they don't, it's, it's become an afterthought. And then you kind of show them and navigate pricing. And, um, to kind of put that into perspective, our sales guys are typically knocking about 200 doors a day. Um, talking to about 50 to 60 people out of those 200 doors and out of those 50 to 60 people, a beginner sales rep is going to make one to two sales. Right. So you're, you're knocking 200 plus doors to get rejected by 50 to 60 people to see one or two people say yes. That toughens up your skin real, real quick or makes you quit real, real quick. Yeah. Very high turnover industry yeah. uh, for sure. Um, it, it's hard to do. I, I've tried that before back in my, I don't know how this is going to sound, but kind of desperate days. <laughs> You know, because you've been there before, you know, yeah. when you get out of high school and you're trying to find your identity, you want to make a little money, you don't know what's going on. Maybe you, you, you know, go to college, maybe you don't go to college and, you know, whatever, because you still have bills. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
you're young enough or old enough, I would say, I mean, happy birthday coming up in the future, Thank like you. within, I think next month. Yeah. May. Turn in 40. May. Yeah. <laughs> the big four Oh, um, but it's, it's one of those deals where you still have your cell phone bill, maybe, you know, or you have to pay for the landline, you got to pay for your car note, you know, even if it's a used car, you still have a car note Yep. and you'll do whatever. And it's just, you learn a lot about people, don't you? Mm-hmm. You know, you, you learn a lot about your coworkers that are, that are rotating door and you learn a lot about the people face to face. But I mean, 17 years, you're not door knocking anymore. I mean, you've, you've stopped that in 2020. Yep. Your leadership, you, you're, Talk to us. You're kind of a what, president by committee. Yeah, yeah. So I'm yeah president of sales. There's three other presidents in in our in our in our company structure. Um, my focus is more on the customer and kind of sales rep facing branding, the social media, the marketing, and the technology. I've kind of always been like a tech and marketing nerd, and so my my kind of lane is is that like the tournaments, the competitions, what's going to drive the sales force? How can we gamify? How can we gamify it and make it more like a sport and give people something to compete upon? So they they wake up and they're competing against somebody else. You know, they're, they're in California, they wake up and they're competing against somebody in the company for a, in a sales-based competition in New York. And every time, you know, that rep makes a sale, you know, every time you make a sale, they know, and there's, you know, a prize on the line or cloud on the line or, or, you know, things like that. So I, I focus on a lot of that kind of stuff, our events, the culture side, um, as well as obviously the training and, and that kind of stuff. And then the two other presidents, uh, we all report to, you know, a, like a senior president of sales or a CRO. And the other two presidents, one is focusing more on our termite pilot and program as we're developing that out and more of our service pro or technician relations. Like how do we maximize our route efficiency for the service side or the install side? So when a sale gets made, it gets put onto a route. How many stops or routes or jobs a day can that service pro do? Are we maximizing their labor and their time effectively? Um, are they having to drive from Gilbert to Chandler, then to Scottsdale, or can we keep them in Gilbert all day? Can we keep them in Tempe, you know, all day? And, and so we're, we're, he's kind of just playing that Tetris game. And then the other, the other president is more over like the, the training of the leadership and then the, like the rep training. And then we all, we are, we're all dynamic enough that we can float into each other's lanes when needed. But, um, you know, it's, it's worked out really, really well to, to really lean into where our strengths are and really be a yin and a yang and, and realize that, um, I mean, you can, you can approach things solo, but I think that most wins are had as a team. Like even people that look like they're, I mean, every Jordan needed a Pippin, every Kobe needed a Shaq, you know, like you need other people that can complement your weaknesses and can make up where you might fall short and, uh, and get things, get things done. So yeah, we, we report to, you know, my, my boss Tosh, and then he kind of runs our relations and our communication between the sales side and the operation side and the strategy side. And, uh, it works, works really, really well. Yeah. So I noticed, and I told you this before we got started, I had listened to a podcast that you had just done and it mm-hmm. was obviously it was very business focused for, for what you do, but I pulled out a lot of nuggets out of that. And one of them is your love of sports, which I already knew because you go to all the games, mm-hmm. you know, and you do the elf thing and the holidays. <laughs> We're going to talk about that a little bit. Okay. But it was enjoyable to listen to someone talk and relate so much to people management, being one of the people in sports at the same time. You know, that sounds like that's really helped you a lot in, you know, maybe your own personal, you know, uh, involvement or belief in it or, or what's the word? Uh, investment, you know, not only in your, in your employees because it's like, all right, in order for us to win, I got to put the right pieces, right people in the right places, you know, you need a Robin to rebound. You need somebody on the wing, like a Kerr or a Paxson to hit that open shot for you. So you can't have one Jordan and four Pippins because you're never going to win that way. Yep. You know, is that, how, how have you used that yeah. in management? Um, I think it really boils down to, for me, it boils down to really, you have to know your people. Like the second that someone is just filling a spot or an open roster spot, just to fill an open roster spot, you've already lost the game. Like you should work hard to fill the open rosters or the spots on your team with the right people to do that. You have to know people. Um, you have to understand their goals, what they want, what they want to achieve, why they want to achieve it. You have to, and, and it's kind of tough because in, in management or in recruiting or in, I guess, managing people as a whole, it's, there's always this, you know, you, you, as a leader or a manager, you can't become too friendly 
right? Like you can't just fall into that because then there's um, people tend to start stepping over boundaries or boundaries get crossed or lines get blurred. Sure. Yeah. But you also can't just be, I'm your boss. This is how it is. Like it, there is a balance, especially in sales or in team, you know, team sports. Like, so I've, I've taken a lot from I mean, I've read 11 rings, you know, the, the Phil, Phil Jackson book. Um, I've read, you know, a lot of stuff around sports. I've read, um, you know, I would recommend like winning by Tim Grover, and relentless by Tim Grover, like giving anything that gives you an inside look into people's like life and sports watching, um, the last dance was super, super, super. I love that. That was, that was awesome. such a good documentary of the redeemed team. Yeah. Anytime you, you see how, or like, well, I like a lot of times I like to watch, um, post game interviews, like the coach talking like coach Kerr or even like coach Hardy on the jazz. Like I want to see how they talk about their players, how they talk about their teams and a lot of times it feels very familial. Like they're, it's almost like they're talking about either a brother or their kids. For the you ones know? that give you yeah. other, something other than coach speak. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But but you you see how they interact as well with with them. And so like I try to like emulate that. And you you see how every player has a different handshake with the coach and, mm. and things. And like you've seen a few videos go viral where, and I don't know if you've seen them too, where like a, a high school teacher takes time to make up a handshake with all of their class students as they come in. Oh, that's and, neat. I haven't seen those. You know, but... and, and it's like, you know, 20 or 30 kids are walking into a classroom in the morning and the teacher's standing at the door and you see them just all these different handshakes and like, and like they're doing the hops and like, and, and to me that is like, if you take time to get to know your people and connect on a, on a familial or on a, on a people level, you're going to have the hearts of your people. And if you have the hearts of your people, like you can lead them to win. And, uh, yeah, so I think to, to kind of go back to your, your question is, yeah, so sports and learning sport, learning about sports and how leadership is working in like the sports world. Um, it's helped me in leadership because for one, there is roster turnover. There's trades that happen. People retire, people get injured. They have to be out for a season. So it's not this like permanent roster of, if you work at a hospital as a heart surgeon, you're the heart surgeon there for 10, 15, 20 years, or if you're a judge or, uh, you know, an attorney, you're working at that same law firm forever. Like you get to know them, but when they leave, there's like a, it leaves like a pretty big void, sure. but with sports, like there's just so much movement, especially basketball. Like I, I love baseball. I love football and stuff, but I love just how fast paced and how quick basketball is smaller, you know, smaller arena, smaller fields or smaller court. And, and so, yeah, you have to know, you know, if you know, you have to know your, your people, and so a lot of times when I'm recruiting them on board and, and talking about the, the opportunity, I don't lead with, you know, here's how much money you can make in this job. And here's what this job has done for me. I, I talk to them about what do they, what, what do they expect this job to help them achieve? Um, I want to talk to them about, you know, what would be a life changing amount of money that you, that if you earned in this job, that would, it would change your life or, what would do, what do you need to make at least minimum for this to not be a wash for you or, a, or a lose scenario. And everybody has a number. Some people, yeah. if they're younger, 18, 19, 20, they might say, I don't want I want to go out this summer and make 15 or 20 grand. And I mean, that's a lot of money for anybody in a four month period. It is. <laughs> and, and, uh, and somebody else might come into that same meeting and say, I want to make 50 grand or I want to make a hundred grand. And so if I know kind of what gets them moving, like what gets them going, what makes them want to go out and work hard. And, and everybody has a different version of success. Like my version of success is very different than yours, you know, than yours would be. Sorry, I keep hitting your it's all right. Yeah. Um, but luckily it has the, the thing there. Um, so I want to understand what they think is success or what they think would be beneficial for them. And some people, they say, I don't really care about the money. I have a hard time talking to people and I want to do this job because it's going to force me to talk to people. Okay. So that's what that kid wants to focus on. I take notes. And I want to make sure that I train him on the communication skills and the interpersonal skills and how to stand and how to head nod and how to smile and how to handle the rejection. So that person I might, if they're already coming into it with that mindset, I might need to help them with their mental and emotional strength. So I'll recommend some books or some podcasts to listen to, and I'll make sure that I, I check in on masters. them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but the people that are more money driven, uh, because they, and I, and I usually ask them like, well, why do you, why do you want to make that? Cause I, everybody has to, you have to have a why like to make money, just to make money doesn't motivate you. are not, it's not going to really get you out of bed in the morning. Um, I mean, some people it will, but really you need to make money because why X, Y, or Z to, 
And, and I don't even like tying it necessarily, especially this younger generation of kids that we primarily work when I say kids, cause you know, they're all 19, you know, 20. They're kids, they're you know, to me, if you're, if you're 25 or younger, you're a kid cause I'm 48. So. Yeah. And, and so it's like, well, I want to go out there. I want to, I want to be able to buy a BMW at the end of the summer or at the end of my sales season. I'm like, great. That's awesome. And hopefully you can, but flip it and, and kind of leverage the, the, the fear a little bit. I believe that using fear as a motivator is actually helpful in, in a lot of scenarios. Whereas like you can say, if I do really well, I can buy a BMW. Great. But if I don't go out and succeed at this job, I won't have a car to drive. Mm. What's going to get mm. you going? I want to be able to pay, you know, I want to go to a nice college. Great. If I don't do well, I can't afford to go to school and further my education. What's going to get you going on the hot, when it's 110 degrees outside, what's going to keep you going? The, if I don't do well, if I don't show up, I can't put food on my family's table. I can't pay for medical bills. I can't put a house over my wife and kids' heads. I can't pay rent. Yes, we, we, and you should have your dream board. I think you should have both. You should definitely have your dream board and your goals and your, your cars and your, your mansion and your, you know, all that stuff on the wall because you have to have something that keeps you pushing. You have to have those, those big whys. But you have to be able, at least in my, in my opinion, what's worked is when I help people see how to leverage fear instead of living in fear, it, it becomes a, a big, big motivator as well. So I have to understand them and then I can, it's pretty simple at that point. I just reverse engineer what their goal is, at least with what I can provide for them in, in this, in this particular job where it's okay. If you want to make this much money, this is what you're going to have to sell to sell this many, this is how many people you're going to have to talk to on average a day, which means you're going to have to knock this many doors per day. So you can, you know, sell this much and do that, or you can build up a sales team of sales representatives and, and people and make, you know, a, a leadership override and sell, you know, sell this many personal accounts and then lead this many accounts on a team to do. And it just kind of becomes simple math. Right. Yeah. And I think that reverse engineering is a skill that we all should learn to do really well, whatever, in whatever field we're, we're at. Like if you can take something apart, you can usually put it back together. But if you were given all these, I mean, you, you take notes, you watch it, you put all your pieces. Like, you know, I, you know, we work, we work on I cars a lot. I screws left when I yeah, take me, my cars me too. apart. <laughs> me too. But, <laughs> I got a whole bucket, like an yeah. ammo box full of <laughs> NSX screws and nuts and bolts that I'm like, yeah, I've sold the car. Yep. Oops. I mean, you do the shake test, right? You, you push the front bumper, back bumper, yep. nothing's rattling. You're usually pretty You're good. To go. pretty good. Yeah, yeah. But if you had those same parts laid out on the floor in front of you with no instructions, putting, putting something, building something with no instructions is, is, is almost impossible. But if you, if you don't have instructions and you can take it apart and have mental notes and, and create your own instructions by reverse engineering, you can usually get it put back together pretty, pretty close, depending on what it is that sure, you're building. And absolutely. so- so I like to reverse engineer people's goals and people's whys. If I can help them take that destination, fill in the steps or as many steps as they can think of to where they're at now in their current state, then it just becomes, okay, I hit this one. This is mile marker one, mile marker two, mile marker three, mile marker four. And they might have to take some detours along the way. There might, I mean, I hit some traffic on the way over here. You know, you might have to, you might have some slowdowns. You might have some detours. You might have some, what I call situational roadblocks. But if you don't know what your people are going, going for and what motivates them, then you can't lead them. And so you have to have the hearts of your, your people and where, you know, where there is no vision, the people perish. I think that's like a Psalm, I think in the, in the, in the Bible, you know, like, and so for me, it's just become that and, and so much about life nowadays is, is transactional. It's what can you do for me? Or it's, I want to talk to this person because he has something that I want. Um, even in sales, like I don't get right into the back in my, my door knocking days when I'd go up and knock on someone's door and I always ask them, how's it going? How's your day? You know, beautiful home. And I'd, I'd start talking and, and honestly, like it would just lead into, well, what are you, what are you doing? What are you, why are you here? And then I'd always still take time to get to know them after the sale was done. I wanted to make it interactional with a transaction as a byproduct. Sure. Yep. Because the, the interaction, at least in, in my mind, has to precede the transaction. Because transactions, like when you, when you walk up and you, you kind of, I mean, I, it's, I don't like, you know, I think you've seen on my Instagram, one of my, one of, one of the days I went on my, uh, one of my self-checkout rants. You know, I hate self-checkout with a, with a freaking passion. I despise it. Mainly, 
Like they don't give you the same belt that moves. You can't put as many groceries on it as quick and move through it. Like I wouldn't mind it if there was like some of the, the amenities that they had at the checkout lines, but really I hate it because it's, there's no interaction there. It just feels like, okay, go in, get your groceries, don't get a discount. Like if they discounted groceries at self-checkout because you're not paying for the labor of the people that are there. Like, again, I think there's, there's some ways to balance it out, but I like going to the checkout line where I can have an interaction with the person. How's your day going? Sure. Good. Yeah. You know, you, you've been here for a while, you get to know them. And, and I just think that the, the more we move away from interactions with people, like that's going to be the demise of our society, in my opinion. It's and, getting there already. And we're, we're hiding behind screens. There's yeah. keyboard warriors everywhere and, and everything. But I, I think that interactions are, are going to keep people unified. And, um, like, I think that as, as, at our core as humans, we need to be in these tribes and have this leadership of people where we can feel a sense of community. And the more we move away from community, I think that as we move away from community, that's chaos. So let's go back to what, how you got built. I mean, this is you, mm -hmm. everything that you're talking about now is it's a culmination of everything you've gone through, but I'm sitting in front of this guy with this really cool car and this huge personality who will, I was going to say rubs elbows with people, but still remains yourself. Mm -hmm. Speaking of elbow though, the very first thing I had in my notes is break down the great elbow. Yeah. I get asked that a lot now. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I grew into my nose, but I, I've had a, you know, side profile. Someone told me that my nose was big for my, my head when I was younger. And, um, and then like, so that kind of went away. Um, but then I think my back then fast fast forward, but rewind to, for me to like in the, like the early two thousands era, um, Mike Birbiglia was a comic. Yeah. I remember. And, yeah. and he had a bit where he talked about how he was born with an elbow on his face and stuff. So then it kind of recycled. And one of my, one of my friends, Donnie was like, you're the elbow, the great elbow, you know, this and that. And, but, but yeah, so I always like, I always felt like I had a bigger, bigger nose, but I always knew I'd grow into it someday. Um, and I didn't let it ever phase me, but like, it was like, I was born with it. You know, you can't fix it if you're, you're born with it. Right. I guess you, you could fix it. We're, we're almost, we're outside of Scottsdale where everyone goes to get yeah. everything, everything oh, yeah. fixed. But, um, but yeah, the, 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 the nose thing was, was kind of where it started, which is stupid, but back when, you know, but then back when Instagram was around, cause we were, we, you know, you based on our ages, like we weren't born into the social media stuff and we had Correct. MySpace, but that wasn't even until like late. Almost, I was I was out of high school when it was know, the late nineties. Yeah, so late nineties, early two thousands. Yeah, MySpace sure. comes up and MySpace Tom, you know, or all of our friend Tom there. Yeah. But um, when when I created my Instagram account back then, I didn't think that Instagram would be what it is now. It's a big marketing tool. It's a tool that everyone looks at. Like if I'm interviewing somebody or someone's coming in to interview with me for a job, they've probably already looked me up on Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn. They want to know who they're going to meet with, who they're going to talk to. And so when I made my Instagram account way back in the early know, days, early days, it, I thought it was a place to post pictures that only my friends and family were going to see. And that was it. And well, so, it was. Yeah. And now it's evolved into this big thing. And so as I, I had that name, the great elbow on my Instagram account, um, I started getting, you know, outside of my, my existing network, people that knew me, knew me of it, uh, by that name and by that kind of just you see that there it's instantly recognizable now. And it is, it does stand out like people are like, what is that? It, it is recognizable. So cool name though. It's it, like, yeah, what does it that is. mean? And yeah, it, there is some mystique around it, but if I could go back in time, you know, I would have grabbed at Kyle or, you know, at Kyle Nielsen or whatever. And I think uh, Kyle from the Nelk boys has at Kyle now on Instagram. He's never going to give that one up. Right. You know, the, the, that's too much of a marketing powerful tool for him, but now that it is like, I can't change it. Like if I change it to at the Kyle Nielsen or at Kyle dot the dot Neil, you know, one of those things, like it's becomes longer, it's not as recognizable. And so I'm just going to lean into it. And now I'm just the, the great elbow, but it's not because I have some sort of powerful fight move. I'm not in the UFC, you know, era. I'm, I'm not, uh, throwing elbows You're not at dusty people. Roads. Yeah. I'm not dusty <laughs> roads. I don't have some sort of, it's not my WWE signature move off the ring, off the, off the bands, but yeah, that's the, that's the name. And so I'm just kind of embracing it. And, uh, but I, for me, it was turning something that could have made me self-conscious when someone brought up the size of my nose in comparison to my face. 
which I, you know, I, I again, I'm sure it did at no. some point, but you may yeah, have just took that away. Yeah, but at the same yeah. time, it's like, it was one of those things where if it was like, if it was something that I could, could have controlled, I guess what I, what I learned from it is if it's something I can change or control, like, yes, you should work on fixing something. But if it's something that you have no control of, like we need to live in this, like in this space of what we can actually control and stop living in this, this big assumption bubble. It's a mindset mm -hmm. and you've learned that mindset early yeah. on. That's amazing. Uh, one of six kids. Yeah. Yeah. Where are you in the pecking order? I'm the middle. I'm okay. the middle. So yeah, five boys, two older brothers, two younger brothers. And then my little sister was born a few years after my youngest brother was born. My dad always, uh, I, I'm the least athletic, I think out of the, out of the bunch. Um, but, but my you dad, played water polo. Yeah, I did play water polo and swam. My, my, my dad, I think one time joked, he's like, yeah, we have, we have our, our basketball team and a cheerleader now. And he looked at me when he said the cheerleader, you know, the cheerleader work. But again, I could have taken offense to that. But instead I'm like, I didn't take the cheerleader as being like a feminine thing. It was like, oh, I am the guy that gets out and rallies our people. I am the guy that hypes up our team. Like, why, why wouldn't that be a, you know, that's not a bad thing. No. But, uh, but the yeah. motivator. Yeah. The motivator. So the person that get behind everybody and push. And, and so that, uh, yeah, but I, I fit in the middle, um, two older brothers, two younger brothers. So I came from the hand-me-downs, the clothes, like. Um, if we wanted a new pair of shoes for this, for the next year, like we could either get the Payless version that my parents could afford or I, you know, which I knew would come with some sort of ridicule and, and teasing from my you know schoolmates, or I could go mow lawns and pull weeds and babysit and sell lemonade and do all those things to then afford a pair of Vans or Converse or you know, something else back that was a little bit more elevated than just the, the pay less, you know, stuff. If I wanted a backpack or, you know, if I wanted a Jan sport versus whatever was, you know, at the 99 cent store, you know, five, five below, I had to go work for it. It's back when people cared more, you know, yeah. like my kids are grown now, but even when they were going through high school, like my son didn't want to have anything with a big logo on it. He's against logo wear. Mm-hmm. And I was talking to my wife about that back in the day. And we're like, man, now these kids, they want to go to Target and get their their clothes. You know, yeah. they want to go to not the Walmarts, but there we had one called Meyer. Yeah. You know, Meyer had Carhartt and had some pretty mm -hmm. decent stuff. You know, in our day, it's like, all right, I got to get the big Nike across the thing. I got to get the cross colors. I got to get the whatever, Jinko jeans. Um, <laughs> Jinko. Yeah, I, I love those. those. So, you, so the, the Payless thing, though, I identify with that. I was just talking to my wife about that. Because she's she asked she goes oh she I think she's watching something on TikTok she goes hey did your parents make you walk up and down the aisle when you put your yeah. shoes on and I go yep. I don't remember if they did or not I said but we always went to Payless because that's all we could get and she yep. goes well me too I go yeah but you're a, a girl and girls can get away with wearing that or guys it's there's nothing like Payless other than Payless because we had the Pro Wings yep and if you had Pro Wings it was Payless. And they had plastic soles on them. And so they had the Pro Wing Eagles, which had rubber soles. But it's just like, do you remember the first pair of shoes you had that wasn't that? Yeah. And you took care of them. You had the, the sneaker whitening. Like you had the, the, the paint with the sponge with on the, the end. The sponge on the end. And, and like just, you'd whiten them up. You'd wash your shoelaces religiously. Like you wanted to keep those things pristine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I went from uh, some shoes that we got at Hypermart, which I think was it's somewhere in Dallas. It was like the first mega store, like a Walmart mm -hmm. called Sergio Valientes or something. And they make clothing. And I thought I was cool because I didn't have to wear the pro wings. And people were like, what the hell are those, dude? So I went from that to Jordan's. Yeah. Cause it's just, you feel like you have to, to do that. Yeah. You know, my dad said, I'll meet you halfway on a pair of shoes. And we went yep. to the store and he looked at them and these were the 91s. So they got the pull up. And he saw the price. He goes, this is the only time I'm doing this. Yeah. Yep. So at that point, moving forward, it had to work. Uh, being that, you know, you're working class, mm -hmm. you know, and that's back in the day where kids had to work all the time. And I don't know, and maybe you know this because being in the sales force that you have, door to door is still, it's high turnover. So you get to see these attitudes of these kids that come in, you know, what their hunger level is and kind of what you're saying earlier. Do they want the BMW? Do they want to be, you, you didn't say this, but are they going to be the next YouTuber or a TikTok star or something yeah. else? You know, people aren't knocking on your door asking if they can mow your lawn anymore, you know, so there's, there's that change. But for you, you know, in high school, like how early was it? Cause you said you'd had to kind of hustle and do what you had to do to sell. Like, when did you know, when did you feel that you kind of had this talent? 
I never, I never knew, I never really took time to identify it as a talent. Like I, but I it did, is a talent. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah, looking back now, yeah. I'm like, I, I should have recognized earlier on, but, but I, I think again, like where, when we grew up, when we heard salesperson, we thought used car salesman, right. like slime ball, like the, like the sales wasn't like an honest, an honest job, which everything is sales. Like and a you're doctor a people person. You've always yeah, been a people person. Yeah. And, yeah. and so like, again, if I wanted to go on the school field trip, I had to go sell rolls of wrapping paper door to door. Like even in elementary school, if I wanted to go to scout camp, cause I was in boy scouts and stuff growing up. You I mean, had to go. Eagle. We'll talk about that. Yeah. That was, that was a fun, a fun, fun little journey, but I, I had to sell, um, here, I'm offering you a Carmelo, Carmelo bar for a dollar. Yeah, yeah. That's what these are. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, uh, yeah, the, the, the world's finest chocolates, yep. you know, if I wanted to, I had to sell the pancake breakfast tickets to go to scout camp for the summer for that four or five days. Like, so it was always out of necessity, but what, and I, what I took that as I didn't ever learn, I didn't ever take the time to say, oh, this is me selling and I'm a salesperson. It was that I want to do something and I'm going to find a way to get there. It was always, I will put in the work, whether that's on, on the labor end, mowing lawns and pulling weeds and, you know, selling lemonade and painting houses or cur painting numbers on curbs or whatever that is. Um, it was just always, this is the means to an end to get what I, what I wanted, but I always loved the interaction of people. I loved putting a smile on people's faces. And, and I, I think it really clicked at one point. It was like, I think it maybe it was in middle school and I was doing like the, the school fundraiser stuff. And I knocked on this guy's door in my neighborhood. Uh, his name was Chuck Shipley or Charles Shipley played for the dolphins back in the day. Um, some Miami dolphins. And he basically just said, Hey, you've made my day better. Like you're a kid out here hustling. I can see that you, that you want to achieve. Like he asked me what it was I was selling this stuff for. So we wanted again to know the why. Mm -hmm. And I said, it's for this, this, and this, and it's so I can achieve this. And he literally cut me like a 300 or $400. He was like, well, how much money do you need to earn? Cut me like a three or $400 check and said, pick out what's going to, to help you get there in this catalog, not only from a price standpoint, cause the price was already there, but there was also a volume, like a piece per, right. like if you can, can you can, if you can choose a bunch of stuff that helps you get to some of the prize levels, I want you to make some prizes too. cut me a check and said, pick out what you think I'd want. That's going to help you hit your goal and bring it back when it comes in. And so it was, and there was when he said, I'm buying because I like you and because you took time to connect with me mm. that I was like, that's a valuable lesson. Yeah. You know, and that could be one of those weird pivotal turning points. Yeah. And nowadays, like when my nephews are earning money for their track team or cross country team or basketball team for their uniforms or for their, their club stuff. I'm like, well, what do you need? How much do you need? How much are you short? I'm like, do everything you can go out there and hustle and do everything you can to get as much money and, and earnings as you can from everybody else, all the donations, but then hit me up at the very end and let me know how much you're short. And I have no problem, you know, 200 bucks or whatever, like writing them a check or sending them some money to make up where they've fallen short after everything they've, they've done. And, and not that I don't want to get, you know, religious for a second, but I, I believe that that's a lot of how, like, I believe in God and I believe mm -hmm. a lot that that's how a lot, a lot, how God, God works. Like, I don't want to get controversial. I don't, but I don't believe that, that just by saying, I believe in God, everything is going to go nice. Like. I believe that like faith without works is, is dead, that, that God is going to make up where you fall short. And, and yes, if, if, if you're giving, if everything you give is putting you at 1% of the hundred that's there, I do believe that if you're giving your all and that's your all is your all is that 1%, I believe God will make up the rest. But if you're at 1% and God knows, and you know more than God knowing, you know, that you can give 50 on that, if we're looking like in a chart or a graph or something, right? God's not going to make God's up, not the, other make up the other forty-nine, and then an additional fifty, because like you have to like I believe that that in life, like you, God or the universe or karma, from like a favorable blessings prosperity standpoint, steps in after you've exhausted your resources. And so for for me, it was it was this: do all that you can first. And then come and, and talk to me and we'll see what we can work out. And if they've put in the, you know, the, the fruits of their labor, if they, if they, if they've shown you that they've done it, and even if it didn't result in anything, like I will take my sales reps, for example, to kind of finish up that, that point. If a rep is going to go out there and knock 200 doors a day, 
without fail every single day, talk to 50, 60 people, talk to 70 people, knock 250 doors a day because they know that they, that's, they're not at the same level as somebody that's really skilled or charismatic and they sell one or two a day. I will bet on that person every day over as far as like, that's the type of person I want to do business with. And, and I want to have in my tribe and be in my, be in my corner than the guy that could go out and sell five or 10 people a day that goes out and works for three or four hours and just coasts the person that's not pushing themselves mm -hmm, sure. um, day in and day out. And I don't expect playoff level performance. That's another, you know, to, to, with the sports, like we're going into the playoffs now. I love playoffs because you see a different animal out of every, every player. You, it, it, you have to tap into reserves that you didn't know were there or that you knew were there, but you knew could only be sustained for a shorter amount of, of time. Like Steph can't play playoff basketball the whole season. Neither can LeBron, neither could Jordan. Like the, well, the intensity, I mean, Jordan. actually, yeah, Jordan did. Jordan like, did. <laughs> Jordan did. Yeah. That's, let's, let's, and, and the game, the game was different, but, <laughs> yeah. but nowadays in the game we're playing now. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why, like, I think there are goats of eras. Like Jordan is to me the, the undisputed goat, but, but if you're, if you're talking eras, like Jordan was the goat of his era, sure, and Kobe yeah. was the goat of his era before Jordan, you have Kare you know, you have, right. you know, LeBron is, is yes, one of the goats of this, of this era, but you can't play playoff basketball all 80 games of the regular season plus the playoff run. Like it's not sustainable from health, longevity, uh, you know, standpoint, mental standpoint. Yeah. But, and so I don't expect playoff level performance from my, my people, but I do need to see effort and that effort needs to be consistent with their goals and with what they want. And so somebody that can go out and, and sell capable of selling 10 or, or 15 people in a day and they're selling two, not breaking a sweat, they're doing it in their sleep, that behavior is going to bleed into other aspects of their life. They're going to approach every a lot of other things. And I don't believe in the how you do one thing is how you do everything because I don't think that one decision or one thing defines you as a person. But I, I do believe that your effort needs to be consistent with your abilities. And if your your effort's not consistent with, with your abilities, you're living below your privileges and below your means. And so, yeah, so I, I, I that that lesson of you made a difference in my life, you took time to connect with me, what do you need to make? Have you already talked to everyone else on the street? Yes. And he, this guy took time to ask me those types of questions so that I could respond confidently to him. Like, yeah, this is what I'm short. And guess what? Did I go and quit after that? Did I call it a day? I had to hit my goal at that point, I, but I kept knocking. I went out and knocked a few more doors, went up another street. And and now I, I, I had, I call it the extra mile. Like, you know, there's no traffic jams on the extra mile. Mm -hmm. And at that point I was now working because I wanted to, not because I had to. And I made more sales. I sold more wrapping paper and buckets of popcorn and chocolates and all of that kind of stuff. And I exceeded the goal and, and didn't just stop. And so when you hit what you want to hit, are you going to go home and say, I, I did what I did. I'm good. Or are you going to say there's one more and the power of one more is, is huge. Sorry for that long, that long no, no, explanation. That was, that, was, but. that was good. Um, what would you say to the person who says, if you take care of, you know, the kid right now, kind of like the guy did with you, mm -hmm. you're taking the hustle and drive away. Yeah. What would you say to that? I think that if that was my first door, I don't think I would have had that interaction. I don't think he would have cut me that check. I think that he, he, again, he took time to ask me, how long have you been out? How many people have you already talked to? How much time have you been? Like what's right. your timeline? Because he was gauging your yeah, exactly. level of effort. And again, he bought because of me, not because of what I was selling. Sure. And, and had that been the first door, he might, he probably would have said, go talk to as many other people in the come neighborhood back to me. and then come back and let me know where you're at. That would have been, I think I would have learned the same lesson at that point. But I think that, yeah, so to, to answer that, like, I, I think that, yeah, you take, it takes the hustle out if you're just giving, if you're being given a handout and, um, yeah, if you're just being given, you know, if that would again, if he would have just cut me that check first door of the day, I wouldn't have learned. And I don't think that would have just been wasted money in his, in his mind too. It wouldn't have helped me. And I think he paid me yeah. that amount to help me, to help, help teach me a lesson. Um, so I, I, again, I think to kind of go back to, to my, where my belief system is with my relationship with, with God is he's going to come back and say, did you do everything you could yet? Right. No. Okay. We'll go keep trying go exhaust your other resources and then let me know where I can fall, where I can make up where you will fall short. And when I, when I set goals in life, I do take it. I, I, I tie a religious aspect to it. Like, why do I want to achieve this goal? 
it, are my motives in the right place? Is my heart in the right place? Is this, are there impure motives or are they majority, you know, good motives and, and the reasons why? And if there are impure motives or, or things about why I want to achieve that or do that thing that aren't aligned with my belief or my God or karma or the universe, I quickly repent and change my mind shift and shift into another, you know, get those things out. And then I, I say, this is what I'm going to do. This is why I want to do it. This is what I'm capable of doing. This is what I can't do personally, or I, I'm going to fall short on. I'm going to fall, have days where I'm not motivated. I'm going to have days where I'm angry or mad or I'm, my emotions aren't in check. So what I'm going to do is this and what I need God or the universe or karma to do are, are these things. And then I take it, I take it to, to God and I say, this is what I want to do. If I do my part, is this a good, healthy goal is will you su support and sustain me in this endeavor i guess is you know the, the better sure, thing yeah. and and if i feel good about that mm -hmm. i mean what else do you need if you know that god or the universe or karma has your back and as long as you do your part like things will work out like what else do you need and that's so time and time again when i really take time to, to get granular with those types of goals and approach th my goals or my life endeavors or journeys with that in mind like i rarely ever fail and if i do I have to look at it. I can't blame God. I can't be like, you didn't do your part. Because if I really look at what it is, it's like, no, like. Maybe I didn't do my part. There were part. a few days where I didn't do what I said yeah. I was going to do. There were a few days I fell short. So why would I, why would God keep a commitment to me when I didn't keep my, my commitment to myself and, and to God, you know? I want to get back, go back to kind of a fun part here. Uh, yeah. The Eagle Scout thing. Yep. You know, I kind of chuckled when I was listening to that because I don't know what it was like when you were in school. So I'm going to ask you. You know, was there a point when you're a Cub Scout, right, where it was just like, was it cool to be a Cub Scout no. in school? So, when I was in school, we're talking 80s here. Yep. And, uh, it's like, you know, God, I'm old. <laughs> but if you're, a, you know, you're a Tiger Cub and then you're a Cub Scout and then you're a big bad Weebolo, yep. right? Yep. It's like you are, you're more popular in school than the athletes. Mm-hmm. But then when you go to middle school, that starts to change a little bit yep. and you're like, oh, yeah, I'm a boy scout and like, you're a what? And I'm like, yeah. And then by the time you're in eighth grade or maybe even ninth grade, you don't really say it anymore. Yeah. Or maybe you've completely, you know, dropped out like most of the kids do at, at sixth grade. Uh, but you made it, even though you said you trickled all the way there, you made it all the way to Eagle. Yeah. And that's a big deal. Like yeah. I made it to first class and I thought I was doing all right, but I didn't make it to Eagle. So that's a big deal, man. And that's commitment. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah, but it was never, you don't remember it ever being kind of cool. Um, yeah. In the early, like the Cub Scout days, like you got yeah. to make your Pinewood Derby cars and like, oh, yeah. like there were, it was, it was cool to do. And you were usually, you were with like other kids either in your neighborhood or like in your school, like you, you knew, you knew the people that were there and you had good friends and, and it was, that it was, was your friend group. Was yeah. Your, it was, it was a friend buddies. group hundred yeah. percent. And like, you'd go out and do a lot of that kind of stuff. And it was cool in that, in that kind of the Cub Scout up to through Weebelows. But dude, you couldn't have paid me money back in high school to wear my, my scout uniform to school. Like no not, way. not at all. Um, and luckily like my scout group, my dad was, was big into scouts. He was an Eagle scout back in the, you know, earlier, like sixties, seventies, like that era when it was a really respectable thing. And like, you learned the skills, you learned survival skills. It was a, a group of people. Your totem chip. You got your totem chip and your, <laughs> you know, like, and your, your fire card and your knife card yep. and all that kind of stuff. And if you misuse it. You got a corner cut off of yep. it. And, and all of that. And, and I saw how much scouting had meant to my dad. And my dad was one of, was one of my scout leaders throughout yeah. my, my life. My, my two older brother, we had a, we had a, a, a lot of times like in our, in our group, there was like this, this rule that you couldn't get your driver's license until you were an Eagle Scout oh, kind of thing. Tough. But my older brothers had came and went, my two older brothers, you know, they, they had, life had taken them through sports and through academics, through other things that took their time away from that. And so they didn't get their Eagle Scout badges. Um, they never achieved that, that class. Uh, but my parents let them start driving. Eventually they were like, we're tired of shuttling them around. Let's get them in a car. Let's let them start carrying the load. And if they can help shuttle the other five kids around, then that's a blessing mm -hmm. and not a curse. So once they had gotten their driver's licenses and they didn't have to have their Eagle Scout badges, I felt a lot less pressure to get it. But I also saw how much it meant to my dad and how much time and effort he right. put on, not only to me, but to all the youth in our, in our, in our church group and all the youth in our community that get, came through the scouting program. Like 
I saw the hour and that's not a paid job as a scout leader. You're, you're volunteer. Mm -hmm. The time that my dad spent to planning these camp outs and these camp trips and these merit badge groups and these, um, just even the weekly meetups and to help us get our merit badges and learn stuff. Like my dad put a lot of time and effort into it and wasn't getting paid anything but pride and like reassurance knowing that he's hopefully making a difference in these kids' lives. And the memories I had as a scout with the going on the road trips in the vans, loading up, camping, capture the flag, like They're the best, the rain trips, like I, those, those were so formative and pivotal for me in my mm -hmm. life and kept me out of some of the other groups that I could have fallen into. And so when it came down to it, it was, I did a lot of it at first for, for my dad. My other two brothers didn't get it. I didn't know if my younger brothers were going to end up achieving theirs. And they, I don't think they did. So I think I'm the only Eagle Scout out of the five boys. And I don't say that to like rub it in my brother's faces, but I knew that it would mean something to my dad. And I knew that my dad put a lot into, into what that meant to, to our group. And so, yeah, it, you, you, after 18, you can't get your Eagle. Like, you know, you, you're, you're out of Boy Scouts at that point. And so I had met with a you're guy. You're a man scout. At yeah. That at point, that point. Man. Yeah. And so I'd met with a guy that helped with some of the Eagle, the Eagle project, like your service project is kind of like the cumulative, like the big portion of it. And you have to have X amount of labor hours that, that make it up and you have to get your project approved. And so there was a guy that was in my, my church that also worked for, the city, like in the parks department. So I went to him and said, Hey, is there a park that needs some extra work and some extra help? I can get the people to show up, but I need to get it done before I turn 18. And, and that's, you have to have everything checked off. You can do your interviews and stuff after like, but as long as you have all of the requirements done before you turn 18, you're good. And so he was like, there's this park that could use some works. So we went out and looked at it and we resurfaced this exercise trail and reprint repainted um, you know, those, the stations along the old parks where it's like, there was the pull-up bar at one right, station yep. and there was like a, a dip station. And like, we put some benches along the way. We put mile markers along the trail. So people knew how long the trail was. So we were out there with the little wheel wheeling around to measure the distance, resurfaced all the stuff that erosion and rain had caused, made it safer. And, uh, so we got that approved by not only the city because it was a city park we were doing it for, but then the Eagle commission or the Eagle board approved it. And we, got a lot of people to show up. So that way we were able to do all the man hours in like three days, two days worth of, of work. And I literally finished that project, I think a week before I turned 18, wow. maybe even a few days. And, you know, I, I'm grateful that I did because again, it was one of those things that you finish what you start. When I was a Cub Scout, my goal was to be an Eagle Scout. I didn't know what it required when I was, got into Boy Scouts in the first class and, you know, second class stuff, like your goal is to end up getting that and any, yeah, I like, do I, do I want to go stand like the Eagle's nest and stuff now? Like whatever, like all the groups of people, like, I don't think I've been back to like met up with groups of other groups of Eagle scouts. I think it's lost some of its luster or whatever it oh, has, yeah. but times but, change. That's but why the principle yeah. is that I, I, you finish what you start and you commit to what you start. And did I get it at 14 or 15 or 16? No. Did I get it at 17? No. Did I get it literally a few days before I turned 18? Yes. And, and again, seeing my dad's reaction when I finished it and did he help, did he pull some strings? Did the city pull some strings? Like, did they all help me to get there? Yes. But they knew also they, they, they understood the importance of helping somebody finish what they started and getting that across the finish line. And so I think that, that has helped me later on in my life to, to really buckle down and say, no, at the start of my summer in my current job now with, I can talk to these reps, you committed to this at the start of the summer, got to finish. Right. Like there's power in finishing, even if you're not going to get the results you need. I believe that that failure and success are habitual, like they're habit forming. You you run into people that they're always out of a job. They can never hang on to a job. They're always sick. They're always this. They're always that. And they're, they've, they've started on this negative spiral and it's so hard to pull yourself out. But if you can get little things like even little goals, like people say, you know, the most, more, most important thing to do when you wake up in the morning is to make your bed you already started your day off doing something good. You get your workouts and stuff done. And, and, and I, I've had a mind shift over the last year, year and a half with my own health, my own like weight and, and what I want to try to do. And, and it, it used to be, I have to go to the gym every single day. That would last a week, last the two weeks is something comes sure. up. Yeah. You wake up late or you have to handle some work stuff. And all of a sudden you didn't make it to the gym. So now you're a failure and you're again, operating from that failures point and, Instead of the win or how can I win? 
And so my, hmm. my, my goal shifted. It was like, I set kind of like, I lowered the bar a little bit where it was, I just need to move and sweat for 30 minutes a day, you know, Monday through su- Monday through Saturday, I want to do some, I want to do focused active movement. I want to be able to move 30 minutes a day. I can do that. Anyone can do that. Whether that's walking at the end of the end of my night or hopping into my, my garage and grabbing the weights or doing, you know, sauna and cold plunge and then, you know, walking, jogging, shooting around, you know, basketball, like I can move, I can focus on being active for a 30 minute period, sweat a little bit. And what I found is that I can do that. And because it's achievable, I find myself exceeding that a lot of times where it's instead of like 30 minutes, I'm now going for 45 or an hour. I finish up at the end of my night, a quick walk around my neighborhood or, um, even walking up and down my stairs at my house a few times just to like, you know, do that. And like, I'm going to go organize my garage, but I'm going to like really get in there. Like not just slow movements. I'm going to get out and move boxes. And like, I want to sweat. It's like, okay, 30 minutes is done. Let's go for another 15 or 20. And then I find myself hopping on the exercise bike or hopping on the treadmill or grabbing weights. And now I'm, now I am getting that hour to an hour and a half in. But what I did was 30 minutes for some people. It might be 10 or 15 or, or 20, but if you can build off of little wins, like you can stack little wins and stacking wins is the habit. It's not the the amount of time that really matters. It's the habit of doing what you said you're going to do. And getting back on the wagon once you've fallen off is so hard. So I would much rather have people set smaller achievable goals that can evolve over time. And so that's kind of really helped me get into better shape and help take care of my body as I'm trying to get better, getting into my, you know, uh, potential grandpa status is like my kids are getting older. I want to be able to run and r- run and play with my grandkids when I have them, you know, and, and sure, extend yeah. my life. And so, um, yeah, I think that the finishing something you say you're going to do, you might finish it later than you, than you committed to, or later than you thought in your mind, but you still got to finish. Like you should still try to try to finish what you start every time you, you commit to something. Let's talk about elf. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about elfing. Elfing, El- elfing around. Um, elfing around. Uh, what what started that for you? And I see you do it at the games. Mm-hmm. Um, but what started that for you? Yeah. And why do you do it? Because it, to me, I see that. And, you know, I, I met the other elf. And he's, he said he's connected with you a little oh, bit. Oh, yeah, on yeah, that. yeah. And he came out here to Arizona and ran around yeah, a little bit. Yeah. And I, I look at that and I'm like, wow, like you have to. I couldn't do that. Mm-hmm. And so part of me like envies being able to just drop who you are and just be who you are. Like, yeah. Be so to me, that's just amazing. But what, mm-hmm. where, what's your elf story? Yeah. So I, I mean, I've always been like, I did a little bit of musical theater and stuff when I was little and mm, like, okay. and, um, we always kind of had these themed costumes with my brothers and stuff growing up. And when I first got married, you know, you would do like these couples costumes with your, with your wife. And like when you're dating, you know, like you do that, that kind of stuff. So like putting on a costume or, and stuff wasn't really ever like, I mean, it's out of my comfort zone, but it was like, sure, if there yeah. was a purpose, like everyone dresses up at Halloween. So like, you're just, you're not uncomfortable. You're kind of, you're one of the sheep at that point. Like you're, you're kind of with the crowd. Everybody does it. So you yeah. do it. Um, but I, I wanted to make, um, we were doing like a sub for Santa thing with my work in, in like 2010 or 11, like some early, early year. And I wanted to make it more fun for the group of people that were going out after hours, after work time between school and juggling everything else. I wanted to make it more memorable for them to go out there and shop and wrap presents and collect donations. And so I went and rented an elf costume from a costume shop in downtown Provo, Utah and uh, rented the elf. I mean, I love the movie elf elf was one of my favorite Christmas movies. I tend to really like Will Ferrell's humor. Um, you know, even like, the Saturday night live stuff, like he's somebody that I, I, I liked his, his humor style and that might be controversial for some people, but I think that it takes again, like I respected that he could go out there and be himself and not really care what people thought. And his, his purpose in doing it was to make people laugh and put a smile on people's faces. And so I was like, I'm going to throw on an elf costume. And so I pulled a little bit of elf from the movie. I, you know, I ran to the costume, suited up, showed up to target and Walmart not telling the people that I was with that I was going to show up in my elf costume. And so immediately they walk in and my circle of people didn't expect it. And the smiles on their faces and the immediate elevation of positivity because they were, they were walking with me through the store and they felt like they were part of, it felt, it it added purpose. Right. And, and so we did that first year, we went out and collected donations and people were pointing and taking pictures and laughing and 
quoting the movie as I walked by, like, hope you find your dad, you know, and like, um, and hey, what's your favorite color, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And it just made the experience better. And when you put that on, like, and I think that when you, whether it's an elf costume or I know a lot of people will, will do like the Iron Man and they'll go visit the kids in the hospital or they'll do Captain America. Like when you put that on, you're putting on what people remember in that movie or remember in that, in that character. And so when you're sitting up, even the people that like do the civil war reenactments and they dress up like Abraham Lincoln, like they're, you're kind of pulling it a part of that person or what they embodied or what they preached in that scenario. And so when I put on a little bit of the elf, like you can't be mad, you can't have a frown on your face. You can't be angry. Correct. You can't you be, can't. Yeah. you can't be flipping people off on the freeway. Like you have to be a positive, happy person. And so that, even though that, that character didn't have a mask, it had a mask, like that perma smile, that happy wave. Like, and so I found that I was happy and happier in that costume because of what the costume meant to the people around me. And so then fast forward to the next year, we went back and I was like, oh, it was fun. I'll do it again, put it on again. And, um, we were in the checkout line and a lady at target was like, you were here last year. That was so fun. I was still mm. laughing about it and it was memorable. Yep. And again, she talked about how happy it made her and how they talked about that elf guy that came in and bought a bunch of presents for a bunch of kids for a few weeks after, you know, like, Hey, remember that elf dude that was here, like bouncing around from all the checkout lines, swiping his card and paying with cash and doing this and this, like, what was that? What was that about? Like that dude was, was funny. And so again, it, it just started kind of click. So it became this thing within my work that, um, every year we do our sub for Santa stuff. And then it became, you know, one day of shopping, I'll wear the elf costume to then the promo videos to get everyone rallied around it. And then local companies started saying, Hey, can the elf come through our drive through to, to buy a so delicious or, you know, swig or whatever, you know, all these, the soda places or the cookie, the cookie stores. And, uh, and then I started wearing it to go drop off treats in our neighborhood with my family. My wife got a little elf costume, the Jovi version, you know, to, to match yeah. mine. And, and then it just became this thing that was spreading positivity. And it really was that it was just like, it started off as a little rock in a little pebble in a pond and it spread some positive ripples. And then it was like, okay, well, how do I take this up to another level? Take it to a jazz game, take it to a, an NBA arena, you know? And so I, I still did all our charity stuff that we were doing in our community with my company, but then I wore it one day to a jazz game and that garnered a lot of attention. And again, I was sitting fairly close. I was like second or third row back in the arena during the Christmas season and the people and the cameras and the, the newscasters and the sports reporters, like they're like, what is this? What is this about? <laughs> and then, so I wore it one, one game during that Christmas season. And the next year I was like, okay, well that was fun. I'll do two or three. And you know, and I, it's, uh, and the costume's not an easy thing to put on. Like it's not only is it tights. But it's like, for me, it's like a whole yellow bodysuit, like a morph suit without a head and hands on it. So it's this yellow bodysuit underneath and you put the, 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 the jacket on and the belt. And for me, I'm bald. So I got to put the wig on and then I have to pin the hat to the wig. And like, it's a process and climbing out of that to use the restroom and like time it and everything like that's, it's a commitment. It's like a four right. to five hour. I'm going to be at a game for two to three plus the drive up there, plus the drive back. And, and so it became a really big commitment. So when you're in it for three or four or five hours, again, when you're wearing that elf costume or Iron Man or, you know, Captain America, like you are in character. And so I'm hopping across the street on the crosswalk. I'm waving at people that are coming into the arena that are leaving the arena. And, um, and again, the people that started coming up to me, the, 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 not the, not the the staff, like the staff in the arena, like the people that help you find their seats, the security guards, those ushers and the things. ushers, they're yeah. all starting. They all get to look forward to it. They're like, the elves here. Yes. Like this is the best part of my day. And then the kids are starting to come up and ask me for autographs. And like, it just became a big, big thing. And so I, I created like an NBA elf, like Instagram and TikTok, And like, I'm not put a whole lot of effort into it now, but it's becoming something that like, uh, it's becoming something that is a little more noticeable where I'm, I'm starting to do some of the away games. And I went to, a Raiders Vikings game during the Christmas season in Vegas in my elf costume. And, um, you know, it, you're, I wore it out of my hotel back to my hotel. I ended up at the craps table and the blackjack table in my elf costume, you know, like, and again, it, it's just garners attention and it is positivity that just you're the people that I talk to end up happier and smiling because of it. The people that I don't even notice are looking at me are smiling, they're laughing. And so for me, it was, what can I contribute to the world 
to even for a split second help somebody laugh or smile that wouldn't have smiled or laughed otherwise. And what can that little smile or little piece of positivity in their life that day turn into or keep them from from experiencing? Like it, they might have just lost their job. They might somebody might be contemplating suicide right. or you know, and, that, and that's that's a story that we could go into, you know, really big was that somebody came up to me after a game one day and was like, you know what, I was coming to this game thinking this is my last thing I'm going to do that's fun for me and then mm. my life is over. And they saw the elf hopping across a crosswalk and saw me in the arena waving and, ra- and you know, harassing a little bit in a playful way yeah. the opposing team's players and, like, my team's players were fist bumping and high-fiving, you know, and... And they were like, you know, what is this guy? Why does he do it? And I, I literally, after the game, he came up and he was like, why are you in your elf costume? Like, what is this about? And I said, I just want to spread positivity. I want to help be a reason that people smile and that are happy because I don't know what people are going through. Right. Yep. And this guy was like, dude, like I was going to kill myself at the end of my night and hearing that you just want to spread positivity and that you're doing it just to help people feel happy. Like I'm going to get through this. Yeah. And that guy is you know, still alive today. And that was four, four years ago. Now he's a CEO of a top five company. I'm put down. Hopefully. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I I don't know. I, I, but, but, but again, like I, you never know the power and, and you don't have to put on an elf costume. Do like the power of a smile or a wave. We're so like in our phones and heads down and faces down. Like even like at a stoplight, like I stop it and look at people at my sides that are driving and stuff. And so make eye, I, someone make eye contact with me, whether I'm in my elf costume or not, I'm going to wave, I'm going to smile. I always tell people, Hey, have a nice day when I'm leaving a building or coming in. If somebody has a name tag, I want to call them by name. I'm like, Hey Jay, how you doing? Like, and they, a lot of times they forget they're wearing a name tag mm-hmm. and they look at me like I know them. And I'm like, I don't know. You just, you got a name tag and you have a name. So you deserve to be called by your name. But then on my way out of that same building, see you, man. Good to see you, Jay. Have a good day. Yeah. And so I think that the world just needs more fist bumps, high fives, hugs, smiles, and like, again, interactions. And, uh, and if that can be a platform, you know, that that turns into with my stupid elf costume, you know, why not? And it does, again, it helps me feel young, keeps me young, keeps me grounded, keeps a smile on my face. And during that time of year, which is supposed to be a happy, giving, grounded time of year where we're thinking about our blessings, thinking about our future, thinking about, um, you know, all of the joys that, that Christmas really in its meaning means even, even the commercial side of it, the commercial side of it is gift giving and giving happiness. And then outside of the commercial side, there's the, the, the religious side of things, but it's supposed to be a time of year that we're, we're supposed to be a little more happy, a little more giving, a little more charitable, but because of the commercialization and the stress and the keeping up with the Joneses and I can only afford this for my kids while my other friends are getting this for theirs. Like it's this time of stress. And so the elf costume just helps to kind of curb that with people. If I'm shopping at a store in my elf costume on Christmas Eve to go get, you know, my last minute stuff and they see an elf hopping through the store and walking through the store, they're going to smile for a second. And so I just, I do it really at this point because I know that it can impact. I know the power of positivity and how positivity can impact people on a whole different, different level. So it was a started off as something novel and has turned now into this idea where I'm, I'm visiting primary children's hospitals right. and I'm helping with foster care kids and I'm doing big toy drives and traveling across the U S in my elf costume through airports on airplanes in, you know, in, in those areas and, uh, in the subways at, in New York. And it just, it's so fun. Yeah. I was, I would ask you what's important to you, but the answer is making a difference. Um, one thing I ask a lot of people who are more in the public eye, like yourself, is perception versus reality. And what I mean by that is when people see you and don't know you, you know, what do you think or what do you know of the perception versus the reality? And you can say that with some of your, you know, your inner circle. You know, you have some very famous people in your inner circle. You're not like them. But the perception could be that you are, you know, so do you... Do you have an answer to perception versus reality? Um, I mean, if someone takes a second to talk to me, they'll know pretty quickly that I'm not this type A, red, alpha, you know. Do you find that that personality? is? Or do you, maybe you never even hear it. I don't know. Like for me, I just, I try not to like, if I ever like catch myself with like a smug look on my face or like I'm looking too, too tough. Now, is there a time and a place to to look 
to walk with purpose and walk like you mm -hmm. are stronger and maybe a little more alpha than you are. Yes, of course. Like there's neighborhoods right. I grew up in. There's places that I lived in Mexico for two years. Like you had to walk, you know, if I was walking around like a, like a happy, flappy, smiley person, that's a target sure. versus like, yeah. I, I mean, I mean business, Yeah. but for the most part, like if I'm, if I see someone at these events or I know that I'm around people that maybe have a certain perception about them, I try to be the first person to walk up to people, shake their hands, ask them how they're doing. Um, you know, what's, what, what are they excited about? Like, that's a good question to ask people. Like, what, what, what are you excited about these days? Mm -hmm. Like what's, what's motivating you? Like what's, what's, what's new and, um, and, and taking time again to connect because we, I think we do get too, especially with, with social media, like social media is putting a fake perception of who people really are. Like even, even some of these people that you might look at and think, oh, like that person is, is a really big, mean alpha. They're always right. And that might be their persona or their character on social media, but you don't see them playing with their kids. You don't see them out giving right. and volunteering. And that's so perception, that, right? There versus yeah, reality. The, the reality of things. And so I think the reality my version or my perception of reality is that more people want to do good in the world than want to do bad. I agree. And that more people really want to make a difference than, than maybe we, we, we give them credit for. And that the stuff that people are doing behind the scenes, like you never see that stuff. And a lot of the stuff doesn't get pushed out there. And, and some of the stuff does. And, and that's why people do share to good for good and bad, them giving food to the homeless and giving backpacks and giving clothes. Like, there's two ways you can look at that. Mm -hmm. You can be like, they don't need to be filming that yeah, right. and be offended. Or you can look at it and say like, it's good that people are putting good into the world. Maybe I should be doing Maybe more. Maybe I should do more. Yeah. And and granted, like, do we need to put a, put a camera into like a homeless person's face and like make, see their reaction while we're giving them the dollars and you know, like, no, I think there's a tactful way to do it and there's an untactful way to do it. But I think that anybody that's doing it at their core, they're doing it to be good. They're not doing it for the likes and views. And if it does evolve into that, because that those likes and views turn into donated dollars for them to make a bigger difference, why are they doing it? They're doing it to make a difference mm -hmm. and that needs to be applauded. So I think that, I think we just need to have a little bit more empathy and grace towards our fellow man and not assume ill intent. Um, you can't assume good intent in everybody and can't put yourself in a position to be taken advantage of. But I think that people inherently want to do good and they might make, make mistakes along the way. I know I have. You know, nobody's perfect, but I think that at their core, I think people need to be given a little bit more, more grace when it comes to like the difference they make. And so my, the perception versus reality is that if someone stumbles across my social media profile or meets me at an event or something, like I want them to know like that really, I, I really am about making a difference. Like I can't take my money with me when I die. Right. I'm not going to blow it all on dumb stuff here but I want to leave, I want to leave impact. I want to make, I want to make the world better for people that are around. I want to, I want to inspire people to make a difference. I want people to band together as a tribe and do good and help the people that can't help themselves and help those people put, be put in a better situation. But I, the, there's so much power that comes from a smile and a wave versus like, like even at the gas station, I, uh, I was putting gas in my car coming over and um, I had my AirPods in, I was on a phone call, I was on a conference call stuff and this kid walks up and he was, he was like, Hey, I do this TikTok thing. I, I film cars at this gas station and I had to balance out the E, the E40. We'll get into the car eventually, but I had to balance out yeah, my, nice. my gas ratios and, uh, and stuff. And I was a little bit on the, on the richer side last, last night when I'd filled up the first time. And so I was getting it kind of, re I was checking everything. AirPods are in, he comes up and he's like, dude, he starts asking me the stuff about the car could have been very easy for me to say, dude, I want to call it. I'm time to talk right now. Yeah. And how would that have impacted him? Like, and I, I wanted to, and I think I might've at the set, like I showed him like, Hey, I want to call Give me a, give me a second, but I could have been a jerk. I could have been dude, like don't film me, get that camera. I'm out. I'm on a call. I've got to gas my car up. Like, I don't have time for this. Like get out of here. But I checked myself and I, I pulled one of my AirPods out, turned off my camera on my, on my phone, um, muted my mic. And I was like, dude, what's up? Like took a second to not be 
You know, but that wouldn't have uh, necessarily made you a bad guy, but correct. that's what he would have but remembered. But his perception would have remembered. He right. doesn't know that I also dress up as an elf and I right, do all this exactly, stuff yeah. that I had just given yeah. the homeless guy when I got off the freeway a hundred dollars sure. at the ga- you know at the at the stoplight because I could tell he needed it. His perception would have been this guy's just another rich a hole right. with a nice car that didn't want to take time to connect. So I pulled my AirPod out, was listening on one other one to make sure if I had to hop onto a call for a second or at, or interject or say something, I could have said, Hey, real quick, like, give me one second to answer this. And I, he asked me about the car, asked what's done to it, talked about it. I asked him what his Instagram was, asked him what his TikTok was, gave him a follow. Like you don't have, you have no idea that when you have a nice car or when people assume that you're wealthy or maybe famous or something like the, the power of asking them, yeah, are you on social media? What is it? I'll give you a follow. And yeah, you might unfollow them in a few weeks or whatever, but like the power of them, like feeling like they, right. you connected with somebody is, is great. So this kid did his little TikTok thing and he'll post it in a few weeks or a few days when it goes live, I'll watch out for it. I'll make a comment on it, thumbs it up. And that could be the difference that keeps that kid going or not, you know? And so, yeah, I, I really the power of, of a smile and of a wave versus and helping people feel seen and heard. I think that's really at the end of the day, like the impact is helping people feel seen and heard and let them know that they matter. You well, might a thousand be the percent person. on that, man. Yeah. <laughs> I always joke, people say, Jay, why do you have a podcast? I go, because my family doesn't want to hear anything I have to say, but there's people out there who do. Exactly. <laughs> Amen. Let's talk about. Let's get to it, man. You, so you have a beautiful car outside and, you know, you're not Mr. Materialistic, so we can just skirt all that, you mm-hmm. know, off. And I'm glad you did this. You, you you brought in the anecdote about the kid at the gas station because we the transition from going from uh, making a difference to, you know, to, to this awesome car. Um, so tell us about it. So you just you just picked it up from the shop. Yeah. The performance shop I'll yeah. add. There's nothing yeah. wrong with the car. Yeah. yeah. Science of Speed. They're great, great shop. Chris has been awesome. His team's been fantastic. But um, yeah, I to kind of go back to why I ended up in an NSX in the first place. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, started selling and, and it was part of my part of my dream board. My brother worked at GM, uh, General Motors back in like 13, 14. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he was, he was on like the Chevy Volt team and stuff, but he would go to like the auto shows and like, I, I fo- started following a lot of like the car innovation because of what he was doing. He was part of the research and development team for, for GM. Right. Um, more recently worked for Apple and now that, that car project is scrapped. I'm not sure, sure where he'll end up, but, um, I was, there was the Detroit auto show. I think that was, it was unveiled in 2013 was when the NSX was like first teased about coming back. It was 13 or 14, whatever one it was, like they had released a promo book Mm -hmm. and it went out to all the Acura dealers and everything too. And I remember looking at, I I had had an Acura TL at the time. Like I had a TL Type S 2007. Mm -hmm. I bought it 2009 and it was like the best car I'd ever bought. That was like, I wanted a a a car and I love it. That car drove super fun. My friend still owns it and it drives no problem. He's like over 250,000 miles on it or something now, but I wanted a car that was flashy enough that like when someone got into it, like, this is a, this is a nice car, but it was, I didn't want to get in the cliche BMWs, the cliche Mercedes is in my field there. Cause I was mm-hmm. a recruiter. I was in the sales world, but I wanted a fun car that was reliable. And again, Honda and Acura had always been JDM. Just, they knew how to build reliable, reliable cars. Mm-hmm. I'd grown up in San Bernardino and I was around a lot of the JDM scene back when fast and furious came out in high school I was helping work at a sign shop that primarily did like, um, like realtor signs, like for sale signs for realtors and stuff. But when the first fast and furious movie came out and they'd filmed it at the Norton air force base and like filmed some scenes in Ontario, California, like the, the car races kind of became a really big thing. And so right. the sign shop I helped work for, um, sin signs, the guy's name was Todd sin S I N N quickly became a rap shop. And so we were, people were bringing in their Jettas and we were doing the dragon logos on the right. sides <laughs> and the, the circle headlights. And so I, I was kind of plugged into that JDM street racing, not the Lamborghinis, Ferraris, like not, none of it was high performance. It right. was muscle car slash JDM rice rocket, you know, yeah. cars, the ricers. I love those things. Like so fun. Um, but so when, when the, when the NSX came out, I had always had a goal to like, I wanted to one day buy a sport car, supercar, And it was a unique enough car that spoke to me a little bit about my, my roots and where I grew up and where I was upbringing. And it was also like, 
not that even back then in 2012 and 13, if you owned a Lamborghini, like you were a big deal Mm -hmm. and you're still a big deal if you, if you own one nowadays, but they are a lot more common. They're a lot more common. Financing is, is a lot easier to get on them and stuff. And people can play the influencer game where they're borrowing There's a big influencer, you know, thing and a, a YouTuber thing. And it's almost, and I mean, YouTubers are awesome Mm -hmm. and most of them that we know they bust their ass and that's a that's a big perception versus reality too like that's a lot of fucking hard work yeah um but it's get a big youtube channel first purchase of ventador you know what i mean so there's there's kind of that weird thing out there yeah and so for, for me it was it was it was this idea and that that promotional book stayed in my office drawer in my office at my headquarters for years. And every time I'd pull out, open my drawer to grab something out of it, it was the first thing I saw. And that was part of my dream board. It was one day I will own an NSX. And, you know, it wasn't even in production yet. It didn't even right. come out until, you know, 16 really. And so fast forward, you know, three years I was looking at it and it was one day I'm going to own an NSX. One day I'm going to own one. So, um, 2018 rolls around, um, end of 18, it was actually yeah, early 19. I was finally at a point where I was like, okay, it's time for me to go. I'm in the, per- I'm in the position now where I can buy one based on my income and based on where I'm at, that it's not going to take away from my ability to provide for my family. So lesson out there to the young listeners, like you don't buy something that you can't afford. Like, you know, don't leverage yourself over leverage yourself unless it obviously, unless that can provide you some sort of passive income, like leverage yourself into properties and into real estate, into income, you know, generating stuff, but a car depreciates. Um, Luckily mine appreciated and I was able to make some money off of it. But I got to the point where it's was okay. I'm, I'm in a position in my life now with my family, my wife, my kids, my home, my job, my career, where I can buy one and afford it and not have it be a, a liability in my life. And I was already kind of in the car scene a little bit. I mean, I'd, I'd bought nicer cars along the way and, and stuff, but I had this thought was like, do I, bo- do I buy a, a Huracan or do I buy a GT3 RS? Like, you know, the, the cars within that kind Excellent of same, vehicles, same, by the way. Great vehicles. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll own one of those someday as well, right. you know. But I, I had told myself, like, I loved the thought of this NSX. And I told myself I would buy an NSX when it was time to buy one. And that's what I want to buy. And honestly, it was the best decision for me. Um, for one, I kept my promise to myself, you know, maybe back to my Eagle Scout days or those other stuff. Like, but it was also the the, per, the 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 purpose behind it was that it was unique. It was a difference. It was a different car than what was out there in the car scenes. When I'd go to the the cars and coffee meetups and I'd go to the car shows, again, it was there was never an NSX in any of these groups. There was and there was only like three or four in Utah. Two of them were owned by the Acura dealership owners that stayed mm. in their garages, mm-hmm. and like one other one would get out there and drive. And so when one came into Utah at a good price point, I paid like I think one one thirty five or one forty four. It had seven thousand miles on when I bought it. I bought it seventeen. When and I drove the crap out of it. I sold it with like twenty seven thousand miles on it, and that was over like a two year period. So they, I really really drove it. Um, I got it sat in PPF, so it had this Batmobile look to it. I loved it. Um, and then they announced the at uh, 2001 Monterey Car Week. They announced the Type S. Was it two? Yeah, it was 2001 Monterey Car Week. Yeah, uh, yeah. or uh, 21. Yeah, 21. Because yeah, yeah. Then, they, then they went on sale not too far like after. The ne- the, yeah. Literally the next morning. Yeah. yeah so <laughs> they they teased it with the little commercials and stuff. Yeah. And you got on the list. I got on the list. I was calling, um, and my 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 dealership actually reached out to me and said, "You drive yours. We see that you drive yours." accuracies that you drive yours everywhere and we you know and luckily like shout out to john um vp of sales of acura Mm -hmm. north america like he is so active on social media in the community and he'll comment he'll like he'll respond to dms like hopefully this doesn't it's crazy that he does do that yeah yeah john akita yep yeah john john's john's an amazing human being yep and like i had posted some photos and some car content and stuff too and so like i i felt like i was part of this community especially this community that was different than the Lamborghinis and Aventadors mm-hmm. and just, and, and the fact that it is a Honda, like still felt, I still felt working class, you know, <laughs> like, <All right. laughs> um, and it was reliable and you could drive it. It was comfortable. And so I ended up getting, you know, I got on the list. I shot my deposit over there. Like, Hey, we can get you the one allocation we're getting. It's yours. Do you want it? How much money do you need? How fast do you need it? Take it. Um, looking back, I wanted the Gotham gray. I think we all wanted the Gotham gray, but looking back, I'm glad I don't, I'm glad I didn't get it. I'm glad I don't have it either. Um, I have my, you know, I got the long beach blue pearl. 
got it all that I needed. So I, I got it at sticker. And that's another cool thing about it is that like you and I, the dealers didn't see this as an opportunity to, to do dealer markups and sticker markups. And we got the car at what it was selling right. for. Yeah. And, um, so we, we got the cars, we were all playing the waiting game. We started seeing the numbers roll off the line and, and we thought originally it was going to be a sequential number, but it was by paint types and you know, everything. So like, I think mine was like, I'm 79 out of the 350. Um, but I bought it and, uh, loved it. I was, I think I met you at 22 car week in Monterey at the unveiling of the ZDX mm -hmm. yeah. and stuff officially. Like we were walking around town and you had some mutual friends that had known people that in my kind of car circle. And, but I think we were, where, where, where you and I really connected was at that Acura event. Right. Yep. And then we saw each other. It's so small there that when you're on Carmel <laughs> and like you, you're walking down the streets, like we saw each other. It a feels bunch like more it's times. blocks. It's bigger yeah, than that, but it, it feels is. like it's blocks. Yeah. yeah it's concentrated to a few little blocks of areas. Yeah. Um, but again, like you had your cars, we talked JDM, we talked NSXs and there was just this connection and community there that, that was awesome. And so, yeah, so I bought the, bought the NSX, um, the Stradman and some buddies in Utah had helped me find the wheels that I wanted. And he had made a YouTube video about it. Um, I remember that. That was pretty cool. And uh, had gifted me these wheels. And I had found other pairs and I'd found other wheels and found other leads and they knew that they had already ordered a set. So they had to keep playing dumb. Like, oh no, dude, that, that buyer, th that, th that one's going to probably flake on you. Or if you do, if they say they can get it now, it's going to be six months out. Like, we'll find you some wheels. Like you'll find the deal. Keep looking. So they knew they were coming in. And then one day, and I had no idea, he borrowed my car to film a car review. And he doesn't do a lot of car reviews. And so I, I should have picked up, that should have been the first red flag. But he left me with his, with his, I think the A12, A12 super fast dropped a Ferrari off in my parking lot at work. So of course I'm going to oblige. I, um, love, I love that car, by the way. Dude, that car, that's a sick car. It's a fun <laughs> car. And uh, so he, he leaves me his car for the day. He takes my car. I think he's going to go drive up like Provo Canyon, see some waterfalls, get some good footage. I take his car, throw my golf clubs in, go golfing. And then at the end of the day, he's like, hey, um, your car, I'm done with your car, but uh, there's somebody, I just have to show you when you get here, but don't be... Don't be worried. Like it's nothing that we can't fix or, or get fixed. If you really don't like, it, you know, if you're worried about it or whatever, like it's nothing we can't fix. I, I think that's what he said. He's like, come here. We'll drop you, drop my car off. You'll grab yours. Something, something happened to it, but it's nothing we can't fix. You know, meaning like he could put, he could yeah. put my stock wheels back on if he wanted to. So I'm, I like speed up in his car to his house to drop his car, get mine. And he has a car elevator in his garage so it mines underground. And that's when I knew something was up because they had some cameras out. I was like, oh, this is some, they did something. Yeah. And, and I thought that it might've been like, I think he had borrowed his buddy Burlacker's smart car one day and put Lamborghini doors on it, like butterfly doors. And now you're like, oh So I was crap. like, crap, what do you do? <laughs> like, cause, cause this wasn't, this wasn't just my old NSX. Yeah. This was like one of 350. So right. it's like, this isn't one that you mess around with. And so it comes up out of the elevator, the wheels, the white wheels are on it, the exact wheels, the exact spec I wanted. And he said, you know, this is, you know, thanks for helping me move some of my cars and for, for helping, you know, sell some, some, sell some of my stuff, some people in your circle. Cool. Uh, man. Appreciate it. Cause I didn't take a, you know, commission to get sure. an interaction, not a transaction. When right. I helped introduce him to people to sell his cars to, it wasn't this like, what's in it for me and nor did I ever expect anything. So it was a really welcome surprise. So I got the white wheels, got the blue car. Um, everybody assumes I'm a BYU fan in Utah because oh, Brigham Young, because the, the colors yeah. are white and blue, and I work it's in a Provo. Different blue though, significantly it is, it is a, different. It is a significantly different, yeah. blue, different blue. But everybody's like, "Oh, that's a good BYU car. You must be a big BYU fan." I'm like, uh, "No, but but let's let's run with it. Like if BYU wants to put a big logo on the hood for their, you know, their roster or uh, booster week or something, I'm I'm happy to sure. let Cosmo Cougar do a backflip over it or something. Like let's make it happen, BYU." Um, so I bought the car, you and I started kind of talking, chatting, texting, like interacting about like the mods that were coming out. When's the lift kit coming out? When are we going to mod it? Are we going to mod it? Because it is such a limited number vehicle. And uh, yeah, so now I got it back. I, uh, we, we, we did the JB four box on ours fun, gave you some little boosts and made it a lot more fun to drive. But then they came out with the K tuner, mm -hmm. which really unlocked some fun power on it really boosted some horsepower and boosted some response on it. You could get a little more pops and bangs and some garbles, which again is something that we wish it did a little bit more of. Um, and then yeah, what three, two, three months ago, they teased the turbos. They uh, in January, they basically said, we're coming out with a pure boost 900 turbo 
mod for it because of the K-Tuner capabilities. We can now put the turbos on and we don't know what it's going to boost yet. We don't know what it's going to, what's going to happen. And I was first in line. Like yeah. I was DMing science of speed. I think you had sent me like, I think it was you that actually put me onto them looking for a, a, a beta tester really. And you know that, you know that I'm one of the ones that's stupid enough to be the first one to be a <laughs> Guinea pig. So I like, I sent an email off to Chris, sign me up. What's the deposit? I'll ship my car down to you. Let's do it. And, uh, they've had it for the past like six, six or seven weeks. And it was snow, snow season in Utah. So I couldn't have driven it, but I picked it up yesterday. E40 mix. So ethanol tune on it, turbos, three inch down pipes. Now, hold on. So you guys listening, these, the type S is 600 horsepower stock period. To the crank, not to the wheel, to the yep. crank. Yep, six hundred. So, so. so in the five hundreds, crank. Five seventy three right? is uh, is the regular car. Yep. I mean, there's. I'm not being pretentious here, but yeah, it's like five something at the crank. I mean, mm. at the wheel. Yeah, yeah like low fives, like five twenty yeah. something. Yeah. I pick it up yesterday. Mm-hmm. They dyno test it. They get all the testing done with E40. It is seven sixty two at the wheel. At the wheel in the eight, into eight hundreds into the eight hundreds at the crank. So mine was really fast with the down pipes, the non catted down pipes, the exhaust, and the K tuner. It was faster than most, but you're 200 horsepower, 200 plus horsepower, even more than me. Yeah, it's insane. It's like and and, and honestly, the the cool thing about it is that I don't have to worry about the quality of work because of science of speed reputation. Of speed, yeah, Chris is an innovator. He's not reckless. He's going to push it to the limits that aren't going to break the vehicle that are going to, that he can stand behind. And he kept like, I got weekly email updates from him on Mondays about where they were with, with things the turbos aren't in yet. They're still working on those. Those have come in when I was pulling this off, looked like you had lost a, a bracket on one of your exhaust, you know, your down pipes, get this, we'll fix this for you. Like he like white glove service start to finish. And again, like I knew that I wasn't going to get it shipped back up to me or go to pick it up and have it, not be have been taken care of in the mm-hmm. best of, of right. care. Yep. So again, shout out to, to them for what they did and the care they took and the communication for me, communication is everything. And I, I felt super part of the loop, even though I wasn't here in Arizona, I'd get photo updates. He sent me a video update at the very end of the process, a YouTube link to my own little private video of here's how you change the tunes. That stuff I already knew, but he did a walk around. Here's how the cars I'll put back together. You see that nothing's wrong with it. Here's how you do. Wow. Here's yep. where you drive it. And like, the attention, like that's, that is like what makes me loyal, not only to the brand and the customer service with Acura is great. Like the, the experience I've had with my dealership in Salt Lake has been fantastic. My interactions with, with Chris at Science of Speed picked it up yesterday. My friend James Stradman picked me up from the airport. We go to pick up the car. Then we, we have a little bit of fun with it on the drive sure. back up to Scottsdale. What, what do you think of it? It's, it's fast. It's, it's nice. I think I ended up on his like snap chat story yeah, yesterday yeah. of like the, the best NSX out there. What did he pick you up in? Um, I can't talk about it yet. Okay. All um, right. No, he'll, he'll release a video. He picked up a, he picked up a new vehicle. Okay. Um, that, so the new vehicle. Okay, yeah. He cool. picked up a new yeah. vehicle that that'll be fun for him to, to, to work with and build some content around. Um, pick me up a new one. That's why I haven't really posted a lot about my stuff yet. Cause I want to respect yeah. his, his channel and get his stuff up, but he picked me up in a fun car and, uh, well, by the time that comes out. Oh yeah. Yeah. It'll, it'll be out. Yeah. It'll be out. But yeah. So, um, but yeah, he, he picked me up in a car that I'll just say didn't have a lot of room in the front. Mm-hmm. And so I had my carry on suitcase between my legs on my drive from the airport to the science of speed. My legs were both asleep <laughs> by the time we get there because of no circulation, right. tight squeeze. But he, he even commented on like the shop just felt clean, felt professional. Um, just really, really cool, cool experience. And then we rallied up to, to our friend Alex's house and grabbed some dinner, but it rips like it is noticeably fast, noticeably more aggressive. Um, you got to be careful on your cornering on second to sure, third gear. Like I bet. It, it's, it's uh, responsive. It puts your stomach into your, you know, into your chest and it's really, really fun. And like it really feels, but again, and, and it's, it doesn't just, it doesn't feel reckless. It just feels powerful. I think the power band on it's really, really consistent. And I'm ex- I don't know what else to do from here on out. Like the just next, the next thing would be, would be to, you know, probably upgraded clutches. 
<laughs> oh yeah, no, the yeah, the lift. The lift is only, the last thing I'm going to probably do to it is, is a yeah. lift when it when it comes out. I know, I know they're close. Okay. But um, yeah, it, you know, it'd be next one would be like bigger, like upgraded clutches and like, but they have to do like engine mods and stuff too. And that all gets that's then you're pushing into like the thirty forty thousand dollar mod world, and it's like I. I, it's, it's where it needs to be. Sure. That's cool, man. Well, uh, Kyle, the great elbow. Thank you for coming by hard parking. Uh, it's Thanks my pleasure that me. you drove all the way over here and, and showed us your awesome car outside or showed me your awesome car outside. Yeah, you we, guys, we you guys don't get to see no, it. So. You get, we're going to go for riding it. Yeah, Keep. I'll see it. You guys won't be able to see it. Hard Parking Podcast, a little bit of cars, so much more available anywhere you get your podcast or check it out at hardparkingpod.com.